Please be seated. You may continue. I want to go back to, to a few things, uh, Investigate. One of the jurors would like to get your attention. I didn't know if it was possible in the future if, like, the interviews are a little hard to make out. I didn't know if it Okay, just so you know that that has come into evidence and you will be able to take it back with you into the jury room and you'll have a, a way to go ahead and play it. Okay, does that help? You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, you may. Uh, Investigator Serena, just to make it clear, uh, at about 52 minutes into that interview, the last one there on the 29th, you were playing the recording for Ms. Lauer, the screams for help, correct? You recall that? The 911, the 911 recording? Yes, I believe so. Okay, all right. And in terms of, uh, you were asking, in terms of who it was when he stated, that, is, that doesn't even sound like me. Do you recall that? Correct, yes. Okay. You were also um, referencing when you interviewed him in terms of that there's only three streets, and I'm referring now to State's Exhibit Number 1. Um, in terms of Retreat of Twin Lakes, there's three streets, is that correct? Yes, sir. There's Retreat View Circle that circles all the way around. And then there's the main one at, in, in terms of Twin Tree Lane that's right here. Goes all the way from the front entrance to the back entrance, correct? Correct. And then there's Long Oak Way. That's the third one right there, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And finally, sir, uh, in your interview of the defendant, you showed him several photographs, including the photograph of the phone, the photograph of victim, et cetera. Is that correct? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. If I may approach a witness, Your Honor? Yes, you may. State Exhibit 94. Is this one of the photographs you showed uh, the defendant? Yes, sir, I believe so. If I may publish that to the jury, Your Honor? Yes, you may. I'll sure. reject the at this oh. point. Uh, I don't see any here or at the bench. Um, at the bench.
to me. Um, Investigator Serena, State's Exhibit 94. Is this one of the photographs you showed the defendant? Yes, it is, sir. Okay, and is that a uh, medical examiner photograph showing the gunshot wound to Trayvon Martin? Yes, it is. Was the purpose in showing this photograph to the defendant to show how skinny, as you stated in the, in the recording, uh, Trayvon Martin was in comparison to the defendant? One of the purposes, yes. And does that photograph accurately depict how skinny Trayvon Martin was? Yes, it does. Thank you, Cross. Yes, I might. I'm going to turn this down unless you need it. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? And how are you? To uh, set the stage, and I know that you had testified to some of this, um, though not all of it, in your direct examination, you were, um, it became the chief investigating officer whose responsibility was the entirety of this case, correct? Yes, sir. So that you were the one who looked at what was done on scene decided what else needed to be done, tasked that out to the other people who would assist you, and basically led the investigation down the path that it was to go. Yes, sir. And in doing that, you've um, assigned different tasks to a number of different law enforcement officers, correct? Yes, sir. Um, gathering evidence was one task that you put out to other officers, correct? Yes, sir. Interviewing additional witnesses and, and sort of setting the stage to get all of the information available that you could, correct? Yes, sir. And um, once you would gather that information, then you would put that together, talk about it with your team. That included everyone up to the chief of police, Bill Lee, correct? Correct. And it even included members of the state attorney's office, the 18th Circuit State Attorney's Office, right? Yes, sir. It was all part of the investigative team that you were basically in charge of. I won't say that you were in charge of the chief of police, but within the context of this investigation, that you were running that team in order to come up with everything that needed to be done to move this case forward. Yes, sir. Okay. You haven't testified to virtually any of that yet, though, have you? You haven't, you haven't testified to the tasks that were given out to the different officers. You haven't testified to your coordination of all that information coming back together, have you? As to the methodology of the case? Yeah. Um, no, I haven't. Basically, the only thing you've testified so far is the, the statements from my client. Correct, yes. Okay. And let's talk about those statements for just a minute. Um, as you first talked to my client, and I'm not going to test your memory too much, but can you give me the timing? We know this event happened on, on the 26th of February 2012, about 7, 7.15. When was the first time that you spoke to my client? At about 5 after midnight on the 27th. Literally seven, six hours after the event happened, correct? It's six hours, five and a half hours. Yeah. Okay. And... At that point, you knew, as was just testified to before you, that he'd been interviewed by Officer Singleton, correct? Yes, sir. And you had that information available to you, correct? Yes, I did. Um, you also had the benefit of all of the other information, at least that which was gathered between 7.15 and midnight from Sanford Police Department, correct? Yes, sir. And you had been working a lot that night talking to witnesses and um, interviewing people, correct? Yes, sir. One of those people that you interviewed was the, uh, what we call the eyewitness, um, I'll ask if you call him the eyewitness, John Good. Yes, sir. Remember he, speaking to him? Yes, sir. And he was the one person who actually had eyes on, on what happened between Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman that night? 
Yes, sir. And you had the benefit of that interview with you as you first talked to Mr. Zimmerman? Yes, I did. So when we look at your interview, um, various interviews with Mr. Zimmerman, um, is it fair then for the jury to take it in context that you had a lot of information to you at midnight that um, Officer Singleton did not have? Yes, sir. Matter of fact, as I think she testified, she had virtually no information available to her at that point, did she? From what I know, no, sir. Right. But um, you had talked to John Good and several other eye or ear witnesses, correct? Yes, I had, sir. Um, had gathered a lot of that information together, either yourself or by tasking other officers who then reported to you. Yes, sir. Okay. And with all of that information sort of as a foundation, you were then able to talk to uh, George Zimmerman and have him walk you through what he perceived to have happened, correct? During our first interview? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, speaking to the one now at 12.05 a.m. on the 27th, seven hours, six hours after the event. Yes, sir. Um, so as we go through it, or as the jury listens to it again, they should keep in mind that when you sort of short circuit through some of the facts with Mr. Zimmerman is because you already know them from other witnesses, correct? Yes, sir. You had talked to um, an officer Singleton, and she had sort of downloaded onto you the substance of the conversation or interview that she had with Mr. Zimmerman, correct? Briefly, I spoke with her, yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through the September, I'm sorry, February 27th interview with you, but um, I'm going to ask you first so that when we go through it, I want you to highlight it for the jury um, if there were any significant differences that existed between um, Officer Singleton's interview several hours earlier and your interview at midnight on the 27th, okay? Okay. okay. Did you notice any significant differences that caused you concern based upon your years of experience as an investigator? Not immediately, no, sir. Okay. For example, you had to focus on how the two people first got in contact with each other, correct? Yes, sir. And did you, do you recall whether or not you had listened to the non-emergency call by the time you talked to Mrs. Zimmerman the first at time? That, at that point, no, sir, I had not. You had not. But you questioned Mr. Zimmerman about whether or not he had followed uh, Mr. Martin, correct? On our first interview, yes. I may have, I'd have to Take the transcript. Yeah, and, and I, I have it, happen to have a partial transcript here if I were to tell you that you said um, you reported a suspicious person. He said, yes, sir. You said you followed him, and he said, yes, sir. Yes, he sir. acknowledged to you that he at least followed and kept an eye on Trayvon Martin, did he not? Yes, he did, yeah. Was that anything that concerned you? No, sir. Okay. You didn't at that point have the benefit of the non-emergency call where the operator asked two times in succession, what's he doing now, or words to like effect? No, I had not. Okay. Um, did it seem to you that the, or you did not have that, I'm sorry, you did not have that benefit of no. that transcript? No, sir. Okay. And you also asked him whether or not he had lost visual of the person, correct? I think I stated to him that he did. I was summarizing what I had known that he had said already. Because that had come from the Singleton interview, correct? Correct. Any concern with that? No, sir. And then you had told him at the beginning of the interview that you would like to do a walkthrough um, or a recreation the next day, correct? Yes, sir. Now, we've had Officer Singleton testify to this, but obviously he was Mirandized, correct? Yes, he was. And affirmatively waived that? Yes, he did. And you knew and you had advised him that had he wanted to stop the interrogation at any point, that that was his right? 
I had Officer Singleton did. Okay. Yeah. And he never stopped the interview, did he? No, he did not. Always no. was willing to answer all of your questions? Completely. Matter of yes. fact, I think it was at the end, of course, you stopped the interview, Rhett, and said that at yes, that sir. point um, you had other things to do with the investigation. Yes, sir. And it was briefly, or just a quick check-in with Mr. Zimmerman at that point to get some questions answered, right? Yes, sir. And in any of this interview with you, and we're going to go through each one with similar questions, did he evidence any anger or disdain towards Mr. Martin? No, sir. Okay. Um, did Officer Singleton even tell you that he wasn't aware that Trayvon Martin had passed away until she told him? I can't recall, sir. Okay. No. The story that Mrs. Zimmerman spoke to you about, and I know that we're going to get into some other um, interviews that went on later. Um, was there anything in that interview that at the point, well, let me back up, I'm sorry. He was in police custody from the time that uh, Officer Singleton interviewed him until the time you did, correct? Yes, he was. And he did not have his cell phone available, did he? I don't believe so, no, he right. didn't. He did not have any access then, did he, to the investigation that was ongoing back at the scene? No, he did not. So would, would you agree then that he was um, unaware of anything that you had discovered as what had happened at the scene? I could safely assume that, yes, he was I unaware. Used, I used the term that it was sort of a virgin interview, the one that he had with Singleton. Right. Yes. First time anyone got to him. And that's that's a police technique, isn't it? You want to get to a shooter, a person who you was at least a person of interest as soon as you can. Correct. Yes, sir. Before they are infected by additional information. Correct. Yes, sir. We refer to it as locking them into a statement. Locking them in. OK. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what's the reason for that? So. Um, the information that he provides can be as pristine as possible without being contaminated by outside influences. Exactly. One of your primary goals as an investigator is to make sure that whatever evidence you can get and keep, as you say, pristine is the way you want to do it, right? Yes, sir. That includes pieces of evidence, correct? Yes. Which is why we use gloves and forceps and bags and evidence tape to make sure it all stays pristine, right? Yes, sir. And it's also why you want to make sure that witnesses stay away from each other. You actually separate them, don't you, so that they don't get a chance to hear what the other one's saying? Under best circumstances, yes, sir. Yeah, it's and, preferred. And why do you do that? It's preferred to keep it pristine, to keep each individual testimony individual. Right. Because if there are going to be differences in the witnesses' testimonies or statements, you want to make sure that they stay apart from each other so not to sort of collaborate on what they say happened. Correct. Whether that is intentional or just a byproduct of hearing what the other witness says, correct? Correct. So in this interview process, Officer Singleton had first shot at Mr. Zimmerman and got that and, and documented it, correct? So to speak, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he was kept separate and apart from the investigation so that your interview with him was also as pristine as you could keep it, correct? Yes, sir. And would you agree that it was, in fact, pristine, that he was not infected with any additional information? Yes, sir. Okay. That information that you had gathered, though, included information that what John Good had told you, correct? Yes, sir. So you were armed with the information of the statement of John Good, well, which was... Overall. You were armed... At the, you're already the chief investigator at this point, right? It was assigned to be your case? Yes, sir. Your responsibility is to find out what all the other witnesses say? Yes, sir. So that you can incorporate that into the next witnesses you talk to as best you can? Yes, sir. That's what you do, right? Tie it all together, yes, sir. Sure. And in tying it all together, <clears throat> when you went to Mrs. Zimmerman during your first interview with him, you had information from John Good and a number of other witnesses, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And that interview from John Good that you had available to you, 
you used when you were questioning Mr. Zimmerman, correct? Yes, sir. Of course. Um, you knew that John Good had no, said. So, Investigator Serino, you um, had the information available from John Good, as well as other, state, other witness statements, when you had this interview with Mr. Zimmerman, correct? Yes, sir. And you had talked to <clears throat> other ear witnesses, or at least read statements that other officers had gathered together of other ear witnesses as to what they heard, correct? Yes, sir. Um, that included Ms. Lauer, who heard, told you she heard what she heard? Yes, sir. Correct? And um, her fiance as well, back then her fiance, right? Jeremy Weinberg. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you had spoken to them yourself? I yes, I have. Okay. So, as you were now going back to Mr. Zimmerman, who did not have this information available to him, tell me what concerns you had with what Mr. Zimmerman told you that night that, that did not comport to the evidence that you were now aware of. I had not at that time. Okay. Did he seem to be um, what cagey in his answering to you? Did he seem to be sidestepping your answers in any form or way to, to get around answering your direct questions? No, sir. Did he seem to do anything that, based upon your training and experience, evidenced to you that he was being less than straightforward with you? No, he was. He was being as straightforward, in my opinion. I think it was in this interview that you talked to him about the anxiety and nightmares that he was going to have because of this event? Yes, sir. What do you mean by that? Well, based on my experience, people who experience trauma traumatic type scenarios like he went through, um, they typically end up with anxiety problems. He appeared to be um, lacking in my opinion, as far as what was going on, what he was in the middle of, it just seemed that something was going on with him. Would you call that, in sort of in generic terms, a real flat affect or affect as to what was happening? Generic terms, yes. Okay. Um, did that cause you concern that he, uh, that he had, in fact, gone through a traumatic event and his response was a flat affect about it? So at some point, yes, it did. Okay. You even said to him, you're going to be anxious, you're going to have nightmares. I'm going to get you some help, All right? Didn't you say that to him? Yes, I did. What help did you mean that you were going to get for him with what he had gone through? Any kind of medical attention. Okay. Um, medical attention if needed. Um, and that would have branched off to whatever he might have needed himself. Sure. Psychological intervention, maybe? After a medical exam, perhaps. Okay. Um, you have not um, had to draw your weapon um, and shoot and kill anyone, have you? No, sir, I have not. Okay. But certainly you know fellow officers who have? Yes, sir. And it is from that experience that you understand what may happen to a person who has had to shoot and kill somebody? Objection as to similar situation, unsimilar situation. My objection is to relevance. It's the same. May I at least be heard as to the relevance? Not relevant what may have happened in, uh, to other people in other situations. Yes, Your Honor. Whatever your life experiences have been, it brought you to the interrogation room that night with Mr. Zimmerman suggesting to him that he was going to have anxiety and nightmares and that you would do 
whatever you could to help him with that, correct? Yes, sir. Was he cleaned up by the time that he got to you? Yes, he was. Did you see what he looked like at the scene? I had seen the picture that Officer Wagner had taken of him prior to. Okay, by the way, the witness room. Just so we're clear. Uh, we approach you back to have the same okay. objection that was. Yes, you may. Officer Serino, we had talked about the trauma of having to shoot somebody. Um, did you also acknowledge to Mrs. Zimmerman that part of the trauma was him getting the injuries he had sustained, getting beat up the way he did? More so than the shooting incident, correct. Okay. Yeah. So let me, with that in mind, let me just show you what's the jury has seen now and is already in evidence and ask you, is, is that some of what you're talking about, the trauma that Mrs. Zimmerman had gone through? And of course, you didn't that, see. That's a trauma he displayed on the night of, correct. Right. This was the picture that you mm -hmm. saw that Officer Wagner had taken of him, correct? Yes. You didn't see Mrs. Zimmerman live in this condition because he had been cleaned up? No, I had not. And similar to this photograph, remember that photograph? That's the one that um, John Manolo showed up. Yes. I hadn't seen that before. Okay. Is, it, is that part of the trauma that you were talking about you had gone through? So I think more specifically the fearing for his life trauma that he was expressing 
um, more than the actual physical injuries, okay. if I may. Yeah. And it is that or a combination of that that led you to this thought that Mrs. Zimmerman had sort of a flat affect about everything that had happened to him that night? Yes, sir. Did it come across to you, though, that he was just uncaring, that he just didn't care that he had gotten beat up and that he had to shoot somebody because of it? Or was it truly your thought that he was reacting to the trauma? I would have no, I don't, I didn't know him prior to this. Um, it could have, it would be included to one of my concerns, yes. However, I, it could be something totally different. So that was one of the concerns that may have been that I think it was uncaring or other things were going on. Did, in the investigation, did he come, I'm sorry, in the um, interview, and we're talking now about the one that happened at midnight, um, did he seem to be cavalier or uncaring in the way he answered your questions? Not necessarily. Anything in the interview that you would point out to the jury where you thought he was acting cavalier, and by that I mean something like, can I go home now, or are we done here, or there's a midnight movie I want to catch. Anything like that that showed up in that interview? Other than potentially making himself unavailable for a next day follow-up because he had to go to class. Right. Um, okay, let's talk about that for a minute. You asked him about doing the um, interview, um, the recreation the next day, right? You asked him what time you get off, and he told you, I have class at 6.30. Um, he also told you, I think the next sentence was, but I can skip it. He may have. Let's say that that's what the transcript shows. If he said that, does that then address your concern that maybe this guy doesn't care much about the investigation because all he wants to do is go to class? I wouldn't specifically go there about the whole thing, but it just appeared odd that he had that on his mind based on what just happened to him and what had ended up happening out there. That, that, it struck me as being different. Does that fall in line with your concern that he had this flat affect? That he just wasn't reacting to what he had just gone through, both in having to shoot and kill somebody and in getting those type of injuries from the beating that he, or the, the incident that he said happened to him? Among other things. Okay. Was it also as concerning to you that he just said, I got to go to work in the morning? After it was midnight, he was still with you, and yet he's planning to go to work in the morning. That was a little concerning. Okay. And again, concerning if, in fact, he was completely uncaring? Uncaring, among other terms. Yeah, but not a concern if it was just further evidence of his reaction to the trauma being just going flat on things. Correct. I mean, I, hard to say. Right. But aside from the fact that he seemed to be acting with his flat affect, there was nothing in his words that suggested an uncaring attitude, was there? No, there wasn't. Matter of fact, um, investigator Singleton told you that he didn't even know that Trayvon Martin had passed. And when he had passed, they had a conversation about God and being Catholic, and that he put his head down and shook his head no when she finally told him that Trayvon Martin had passed. She told you that, right? I don't recall that conversation, but she may have. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did, um, did anything at all, and, and I want you to really drill into it, and, and I'm sorry, I know that you've heard it. I have a transcript of the interview. Would that assist you as I ask you some questions about the interview? Um, if you have an extra copy, I might have one myself. Okay. Up to the state, if I might. Um, let me show it to the state first. It's not the official court reporter's transcript, but it may be used to refresh your recollection.
For identification um, defense exhibit double G. It's double I. Double I. Oh. I first the witness? Yes, you may. Thanks. I'm not going to have you go through it line by line at all, but um, basically to use it to refresh your recollection to the extent that we need to. The question is this, and only refer, only refer to that document if you need to to refresh your recollection. Right. Was there anything in the interview with Mr. Zimmerman on February 27th at 12:05 that was specifically contradicted by the evidence that you had available to you at that point? No, sir. As an example, he said he shot once. There was only one shot fired, correct? Correct. Um, he said that his head was being hit where it was, and John Good said that they were in that same location. He even told you that the witnesses that talked to you about the facts of the event, none of those facts presented by those witnesses contested Mr. Zimmerman's rendition of the facts, did they? Not at that point, no, sir. Um, including witnesses who were right there after the shooting had occurred that saw Mrs. Zimmerman, correct? There was no conflict there, was there? No, sir. There was no conflict with the initial investigation officer who came on the scene. I think it was Tim Smith. What he told you did not conflict with what Mrs. Zimmerman had told you, right? Not at all, no, sir. One fact anywhere in that interview that was contested by a fact that you knew from the investigation. None that, I, none that I found. Thank you. Then, if I might retrieve the document. Yes. And then, if you would. Would um, remind the jury the next time you had contact with Mr. Zimmerman? Probably over the phone prior to meeting with him on the 29th. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, the next day, I'm sorry, the, the That's okay. Uh, yeah. I was going to remind Later you. Later on the day, yeah. Uh, you had contact with him the next day when he came um, and met with you to do the walkthrough, correct? Yeah. Uh, Technically, we created the same day, yes, sir. Okay. And of course, that's the video that you were here for, yes, right? Um, so, he went to work that day, it seemed, because he waited until he got off work, correct? He made my appoint our appointment. I don't know if he went to work or not, but. Okay. And um, he was willing to do the recreation still, correct, as we saw on the tape? Yes, sir. Any concern with doing that? No, he was All right. available. Um, did you notice a, a similar behavior, this, we're calling it now this flat affect behavior, even in the video as well? No, he, uh, he was a little more animated. A little bit more resolved? You could use that word, I okay. guess. And um, focus on the recreation and let me ask you to point out for the jury inconsistencies that you noticed i'm going to ask you for two types the first is tell me the significant tell the jury the significant inconsistencies between that recreation video and what he had told you the night before right let's just start there okay my interview with him let me clear this up, if I may. Certainly. Was a brief overview of what I had, and it wasn't an expensive interview. Um, I can attest to what the interview with the Officer Singleton and the walkthrough was based on what I saw. That'd be more fair. I kind of went in there to move things along because 
So I was kind of focused on trying to identify who the decedent was at that time. Who but what? I was, trying, I was more focused on trying to identify the deceased at that point. Right. So the interview with him was rather short, if you can call it an interview, but I'll, yeah, I'll try. Okay, but the one talking about the interview at midnight, talking about, correct? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. But that's where you had at that point, and, and let me open up the comparison for a moment to say, I also want you to tell us of any discrepancies in the recreation video that existed either in your interview with him at midnight or investigator or officer Singleton's interview with him at 8 p.m. that you had available to you. So okay. as the investigating officer, you've looked at, I'm not going to talk about the other evidence yet, we're going to get to that in a second, but just my client's statements to either Officer Singleton or you the night before and the differences that you noticed in the video. Okay, sir. Okay, that's, that's my premise question. So tell me, what are those? I can't think of them offhand. None specific, none that come to mind right now, no. Okay. Obviously, you had an opportunity to review all of this information well before today, correct? Yes, I did. I mean, you were studying this for, from the 27th uh, until, I think, at least March 12th or thereabouts, correct? Yeah. I've been studying it, yes. But, and that included all of the information and reviewing all of his statements and comparing them, correct? Um, yes, well, but when you say inconsistencies, um, I can tell you as far as um, a, a statement saying they fell as soon as he was hit once. Sure. I mean, it's, you know. Well, let me premise it with this then. In a situation like this where you have what you believe Mr. Zimmerman went through, both parts of that trauma mm -hmm. um, and multiple uh, interviews of him. Would you expect that there are going to be some differences? Absolutely. And why is that? Because we're not robots as people. I mean, not knowing him personally, um, I don't think I've ever heard of somebody remembering step by step exactly how stuff occurred that they were involved in unless you're looking from the outside, looking in. Matter of fact, if someone were to come to you and have the exact same story down, fact for fact and word for word, sentence for sentence, each time you talk to them, what would you think about that person's honesty or veracity? I, uh, either they're being completely honest or completely false to an extreme. If you, as a cop on the street, came upon somebody and asked them three different times, three weeks apart, what happened, and they came up with the exact same story, wouldn't you think they were lying to you each and every time? It's hard to say. I'm a professional skeptic. It's uh, hard okay. to say. I guess it's sort of job security being a professional skeptic, right? So the job requirement in. more. And, yeah, requirement, yeah. I guess. Okay. So, in your interviews continuing as they were with Mr. Zimmerman, you would expect that things are going to change over time, correct? Potentially, yes. You would, and if they were to change in significant ways, if he were to add in some brand new fact or truly change direction, you would note that, correct? Yes, sir. Because that would, in fact, suggest a change not just in the presentation, but in the real substance of it. Yes, sir. And you're attuned to look for those as the investigator in this case? Yes, sir. And did you notice anything to bring to the jury's attention today that caused you that concern, that spidey sense that something's going wrong with what he's telling you? Nothing I can articulate, no, sir. Matter of fact, as we look at that video, as you looked at it, it was quite consistent with what he had told you before, correct? Yes, sir. And though it was longer and more was discussed, there was nothing in that recreation where he moved things around or did things differently or suggested things happen in a different location, did he? Nothing major, no, sir. Okay. Now, let's talk about, and we're building up to what I call the challenge interview. I know that's next, but let's stick on this one, the recreation interview. Um, 
You, of course, had some more information. You had another day's worth of an investigation, right? Because you were working the case the entirety of the 27th, right? Yes, sir. So you had been gathering more witness statements and more of the um, law enforcement workup that was being done, correct? Yes, sir. Um, would you agree you probably had a dozen or 15 witness statements available to you on the 27th? Uh, approximately. Right. Somewhere there. And had reviewed all of those in planning for your next communication with Mr. Zimmerman? Yes, sir. Okay. Did what he say on the recreation video contradict any of the witness statements that you had gotten so far by Friday, or sorry, the 27th at 5 p.m.? Nothing directly. Anything at all that you can explain to the jury where you looked at it and said, this piece isn't fitting? Nothing as far as the information that he had given us, no. Would you agree that any of the slight inconsistencies that did exist on that video you would sort of assign as just being the way interviews go? Perhaps, yes. Well, anything else besides that? Nothing that comes to mind, no, as far as something that would have triggered something more than just me continuing to talk to him. Okay. Because at this point, you had fairly specific evidence that Mrs. Zimmerman was acting in self-defense that night, correct? I had information that would have supported that, yes, sir. Well, you had his injuries, for one, correct? Correct. That certainly fit into your formula, did it not? Yes. You had a bunch of witness statements, including John Good, correct? Yes. And that fit into the self-defense theory that you were looking into, right? Yes. Part of your job uh, is to investigate crime, right? I mean, pretty much most of what you do. Yes, sir. And in the context of investigating crime, you also, by nature, have to investi investigate the existing defenses, right? Absolutely. You are charged with the responsibility of looking at an event like this and determining whether or not self-defense yes, exists. May I, do you, may we approach the bench regarding this issue. Yes. respected to the jury room. Mm -hmm. To the um, court, um, 
the testimony beginning the um, it, it would be the questions and the answers beginning with the uh, self-defense issues. And then one right before that, one was when I asked him about that he investigates crimes. And I think that was well, I think it goes further beyond that. That's what I'm asking okay. for. Okay, would you agree that any of the slight inconsistencies that he did exist, that did exist on the video, you would sort of assign as just being the way interviews go? Answer, perhaps yes. Question, well, anything else besides that? Answer, not that comes to mind. No, as far as something that would have triggered something more than just being continuing to talk to him. Question, because at this point, you had fairly specific evidence that Mr. Zimmerman was acting in self-defense that night, correct? Answer, I had information that would have su supported that, yes, sir. Question, well, you had his injuries for one, correct? Answer, correct. Question, that certainly fits into your formula, did it not? Answer, yes. Question, you had a bunch of witness statements, including John Good, correct? Answer, yes, sir. Question, and that fits into the self-defense theory that you were looking into, right? Answer, yes. Question, part of your job is to investigate crime, right? I mean, pretty much most what, of what you do. Answer, yes, sir. Question, and in the context of, of investigating crime, you also by nature have to investigate the existing, existing defenses, right? Answer, absolutely. Question, you are charged with the responsibility of looking at an event like this and understanding whether or not self-defense exists. And there was the objection. I, I think that you're getting very close to um, the motion in limine that was um, ruled upon by this court. So, I'm going to ask this question be allowed to be answered, and then I'll move on. Okay. So the objection to anything further would be sustained. You may finish with this one question and then move on. This is Mr. Daly. Just a moment ago with the timing, if you wanted to address that now. I don't think that I'm going to finish any time very soon with this witness, so your call as to whether or not we stop now, because they're out already, and then just come back in the morning. Um, I'm going to ask the jury um, okay. how, how far they want to go, if they want to go sure. until 6 o'clock, because it's uh, 525. And, uh, so let's go ahead and bring the jury back in.
Please be seated. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're not going to finish with um, Officer Serino tonight. I wanted to get some kind of feel from you as to how late you wanted to stay. If we stayed till six o'clock, would that be too much for you? No. Okay, you may proceed. The last question I'm just going to restate, so it's not going to be exact, but we were talking about what you do as a law enforcement officer, you investigate crime, correct? Yes, sir. And in investigating crimes, you are also have the charge or the responsibility to look into whether or not defenses exist, such as self-defense. Yes, sir. Okay. And that was just a continuing sort of overview that you have in all cases. Yes, sir. Okay. So now let's move forward. And I, I think you said earlier there was nothing specifically um, inconsistent with the statements before and the recreation video, correct? No, sir. Okay. Now let's just sort of move forward into your next efforts in this regard. I'm going to then move us up pretty quickly to the next interview with Mr. Zimmerman. But before you got to that next interview with Mr. Zimmerman, tell the jury, if you would, what other actions you were doing as the investigating officer? From the beginning? Well, we, yeah, we sort uh, of gone through uh, the 26th, correct, that okay. night. And then we've talked about that you had a dozen or so witness statements you'd already gathered on the 27th. Okay. And that we had um, the interview and the, the recreation interview on the 27th. So moving us from that point forward. Okay, other than identifying Trayvon himself and as far as my, you want my timeline as far as what I was doing as far as yes. as it pertains to George? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, on the day after, um, after identifying, well, on the day of the incident, I spent several hours um, attempting to identify Trayvon and um, I spent most of the night doing that actually. And after identifying him, I had to go ahead and um, make arrangements to get him released. The interviews that were conducted um, in preparation for my next interview with George um, had to be listened to, compared to, with a written statement that he provided us. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, and ultimately, you know, not to consolidate it for you, but um, he, um, we had to essentially. Um, we realized that the only person that saw what happened or how it initiated was going to be George because at that point we couldn't find any other witnesses to say how it began, um, what was the first encounter. Right. Um, and um, if I might, I don't want to right. interrupt you for just for a moment and then I want to go back on that track. Mm -hmm. At this point you did have available to you the non-emergency call. Correct? Yes, I did. So you did know what Mr. Zimmerman was saying to the non-emergency operator at that point, and you also had Ms. Lauer's 911 call where you heard the screaming, correct? Yes, I did. Okay, so with that in context, you were telling us sort of now you're trying to figure out no other witness is there who can say, I saw them come together. Uh, we could not locate anybody who could um, say that they saw that exactly. We. Um, what we had with the 911 calls and the yells in the background, um, statements from Mr. Good, who actually saw, um, no reason not to believe him, statements that your client made that corroborated everything else. Um, and that's where we were on that last interview. I had nothing of substance to basically toss at him, to confront him with as far as the interview went, other than suspicious um, lack of remembering the streets, how many streets you had in this neighborhood, um, and other oddities, but that would have compelled me to go ahead and keep on interviewing him. So this didn't quite add up, but it had to have been further. So then what you decided to take on, uh, which is another mm -hmm. useful um, police tactic, if you will, is what's called a challenge interview. Correct? 
at this point, I wasn't ready for one, but yes. Right. I mean, that, that was, you, you were also under quite a deal of pressure to get this case moved forward, correct? Yes, I was. And had to move even quicker than you would otherwise have moved on this case because of some of the external pressures that we now know existed in this case. Yes, sir. And it was for that reason, then, that you may have moved a little bit quicker than you otherwise would like to to interview Mrs. Zimmerman in sort of this aggressive context, correct? Yes. And, and I'm not saying that as though it's bad when I say no. it's aggressive. You're taught how to do this, correct? Yes. You're also taught, for example, as a law enforcement officer, how to use the command voice in a situation when you walk in, right? If you need to take control of a couple of people or whatever it is, anything it is, they teach you how to take control, and that is get in their face a little bit, wake them up, use a loud voice, because it works, right? Yeah, assertiveness, yeah. you know, if properly sure. used is effective. And you also learn how to use all your weapon systems so we know when to use what and how to use it and how to get control. And that's what you do as a cop, right? Yes, sir. And, and you get that both from the academy and you get it from the years of experience. Yes, and sir. one of those things that you get from those years of experience is what I've called a challenge interview. I don't know if you have a different term for it, but is that what it is? Don't have a name for it, but it's basically yeah. a challenge interview. And that's where you go in and you try to undermine a interviewee's story to them, right? Where you challenge them, you, you sort of, and it, we go back and forth with first you're being nice and you're not being nice and you set them up and, and then you knock them down, correct? That's a technique. And I don't mean to give up your secrets, but no, I mean, not yeah. at all. I mean, it's. Right. That's the, that's, these are techniques, the purpose of which is to see if you can break somebody's story, right? And to discover truth, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, particularly in a case of this where you're under a lot of pressure from the outside and don't have a lot of inconsistencies that you need to either get through to Mr. Zimmerman in this case and break it or not. Correct? It's a compound question. Did you understand what I said? Repeat it, please. Sure. Mm -hmm. Your intent in this case, mm -hmm. because of everything that was going on, was that you wanted to get Mrs. Zimmerman in a position where if you could break him, if you could get him to change his story in a significant way, then you can find out he's lying. Right? Correct. That's one of them, right? Yes, sir. Um, at the very least, what you do is you try and crack that door open a little bit, right? Get a sh just a stream of light coming through so that you can really push through it if he's lying to you. Yeah, I'm seeking, you know, the omission that may be there, um, the exaggeration that may be there. Yeah. Just, yeah, or the anger that may be there that he didn't show before, you know, or just the hit him with something that you might even exaggerate as a problem, just to see if he bites, right? Okay. I don't mean, you want to get more information from him too. Absolutely. Yeah, right? I, there was a lot of information I didn't have to challenge him with, but yes, that's one of the but, intentions behind okay. that interview. You would agree that the style of this interview, as we've just heard it, mm -hmm is a more aggressive style of interview that you took on because you want to get some information from Mrs. Zimmerman to challenge him on what he knew and didn't know, right? You could say that, yes. Mm -mm. Will you say that? Um, it was more challenging than the first interview. Um, okay. But on the scale of challenging interviews, it was mild. You've had challenge interviews that were much more in the person's face, correct? Usually when I had something more than what I had. And I was just going to say, that's where you walk into the, the guy who just, you know, exactly. stole eight cars in the neighborhood, and you have his fingerprints on six of them, and he's just telling you that he was in the library studying. Right? Right. So that's the, that challenge interview is you walk in and go, you got one last chance. You're going to prison for a long, long time, or you're telling me what happened. And that's a real aggressive challenge interview, correct? Yes, sir. So you have to modify the challenge interview style based upon what it is you actually have to hit him with. Exactly. And in this case, you didn't have much to hit him with, right? No, sir, I did not. Okay. 
So he's sort of walking through everything that he had done. Now, the reason why you're having him repeat everything in greater detail is, again, to see if you can wean out any inconsistencies from him, right? Or omissions, yes. Or omissions, yes. He may just break down and say something that he didn't acknowledge before. Admission, omissions. Yeah, I was talking about stuff. Oh, I thought you said admission. Okay. More information. And as to the information, the first few pages, anything else that he added that he had not talked to you about, at least in general terms? No, sir. Anything inconsistent? Nothing that, no, nothing major. Then you start with, again, some of the sort of psychological underplay with him that he's going to be under a lot of scrutiny, right? You're trying to go to bat for him. You're going to have to speak for him, right? That you start well, laying that into the framework here? In this particular case, I mean, he could have been considered a victim also. I mean, it's just, it's one of those investigations where. Well, agreed, but you were dealing with a lot going on that impacted on your investigation, correct? Regardless of what was going on, I still kept an open mind that he could be a victim. Okay. Um, and in focusing him on some of what you thought you might have to defend when you were saying that you'd have to speak for him and it's going to be under a lot of scrutiny, this whole question of whether or not George profiled him that you mentioned, right? Yes. And you sort of hit him with that pretty straight out of the box, right? Hoping maybe for a response that would give you an insight as to whether or not he was profiling Trayvon because Trayvon was black? More of an explanation and more of an explanation I was seeking. Okay. Um, so you asked him if he had been white, would you have reacted the same way? And he said yes. Yes, sir. Did that cause you any concern? No. Think it was being straightforward? Yes. Any evidence in your investigation is to suggest differently up no. to that point? But you would agree that that was sort of something you want to play out there for him to respond to see if that might open something up? There were external concerns about that, external concerns, and I needed to get that clarified. Okay. And you did? Yes, I did. And had he had, had that question gone somewhere else, that may have led you down a different path? Yes, sir. You also had a concern that you evidenced to him or sort of challenged him on because you had an issue of whether or not his rendition of getting hit dozens of times were supported by the forensic evidence of his injuries, correct? In my view, yes. Yeah. They, they were lacking. Yeah, because he said, I think one of you questioned him, and he said, I, I got hit 20, 25 times, right? I believe he said 25 or 30 times. 25 yes. or 30. It didn't seem as though there was injuries sufficient for somebody getting hit 25 or 30 times, right? No, it did not. Okay. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the trauma that he had been through, um, do you believe in your investigation of him that it may have just felt like he was getting hit 25 or 30 times? Based on personal experience, it could be a panic thing more. Yes, it very well could have been. Okay. So that in and of itself was an area that was a concern of yours, correct, but not something that suggested that he was just making that story up, did it? Um, no. Matter of fact, have you had a chance to look at the pictures of his injuries before they started healing when you saw him? Yes, I did. Okay, those are the injuries that were taken at SPD, Stanford Police Department, that night? Yes. Without having you go through each and every one, the jury's seen them now probably three or four times. Um, would you agree that there were numerous different bruisings and injuries on both sides of his scalp first? There were injuries. Um, okay. However, based on the way I view them as a major crimes investigator who's seen injuries a lot worse than that, I didn't consider them life-threatening. Of course. Matter of fact, we don't, again, and, and we don't need to see life-threatening injuries, do we? No. Um, okay. We don't need to see any injuries, do we? No, we don't. 
Yeah, he did have some. Yes, he did. And he had the nose injuries we talked about, and he had the lacerations on the back. You saw those pictures, right? Yes, sir. And he did see, you saw the bruising or the swelling on both sides of his head. Did you see those? I saw, yeah. I saw imperfections, um, you can call it that, yes. Yeah, some I, what they call punctate bruising, like cement bruising on the... Bumps, them. contusions, yeah. Okay. And to the extent that you don't recount them all here today, agree that the jury can simply look at those pictures that were available to you at the Tampa Police Department taken really right around the time of the first midnight interview and, and rely on those rather than your memory? Yes. But still, in your mind, it, it was questionable to you why he thought he was getting hit 25 or 30 times. I was being subjective, trying to, yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah. Uh, and that was... Did you finish? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm good enough. Okay. And that was one of the sort of subjects you focused on to see if you can move him a little bit? Perhaps, yes. Mm -hmm. You also sort of questioned him a number of different ways in this challenge interview on um, the following, and whether or not he was following him down the pathway or just getting out of the car. Uh, he was pretty consistent with you, right, that um, he did follow him, right, to begin with. Yes. He acknowledged that, never denied that, did he? I think at one point he said he got out behind him, and I just clarified that it was, in fact, a follow, but it was the same thing. He, right. said, this, he said the same thing. Okay. And um, then there was this question about um, why he didn't simply acknowledge to Trayvon Martin who he was or what he was doing, correct? Yes. And you questioned him in a couple of different ways on that as well. Yes. Did his answer to you satisfy you? Not necessarily. Tell me what your concern was. He had made reference to mentoring children, um, specifically African-American children. Why um, it didn't occur to him to go ahead and try to say something to somebody he was following. Sure. In hindsight. Of course. That might have resolved things. Absolutely. And there are actually probably a thousand decisions in hindsight that would have changed the outcome of this event, right? But specifically, as far as my interview with him, that was a concern. That was a concern. And um, and what he said to you, and referring to the tape, was, why didn't you, was it fear, precaution, safety, all the above, tell me what's going through your head, and, you, and he said, I didn't want to confront him, that wasn't my job. Correct. And did that seem a reasonable explanation to you? I took it at that, yes. Yes. You also challenged him on the question about some of the timing, about when Trayvon Martin was near the car, when he wasn't, whether or not he'd come back towards the car or not, correct? I believe that was um, while he was going back to his truck, George was Zimmerman, your client. Mm -hmm. He was, I questioned about the time that took him to get back to his vehicle. Okay. Yeah, because you were wondering why it might take 80 seconds if he was at the T intersection, why it would take 80 seconds to walk back to his car? Yes, it seemed that there was a pause somewhere in there. Yeah, and he said to you... It seemed there was a pause in there somewhere, like he paused. It seemed like there would be a pause in there because of time. Right, because there's about 80 seconds that you want to at least have him explain to you, correct? Yes, sir. And in context, he explained to you by saying... That was when I'd actually walked all the way over to my street, Retreat View Circle, which was those 40, 50, 60, we'll look at it, feet or so, to Retreat View Circle past the T, correct? I don't recall his responses, but I, I was measuring from Retreat View Circle to his vehicle, and I'd have to listen to it again, okay. but it just seemed excessive. There was a... 
there was a time there. But I do think that he did say that he uh, actually paused to pick up his flashlight or something. To pick up? His flashlight. Somewhere in there. Again, we'll sort of defer to the tape as okay. far as exactly what was said back and forth during this interview. The, uh, another effort that you did, a sort of significant one, was when you told him that um, Trayvon Martin would videotape a lot of what he was doing and that you believed that this whole event may well have been on video. Yes, sir. Correct? Yes, sir. Um, Again, a very specific challenge um, interrogation technique, is it not? Yes, sir. When you can say, you know, there's that bank just across the street and they had just installed brand new cameras, light night cameras, color cameras, and we got real good video. And the reason for doing that is because that's truly an attempt to let this guy know, whoever it is, that you got him. Right? That can serve a lot. That's more of a bluff. At sure. The, in this one, to say that I got him, that's, you know, that's uh, just to put in his mind that right. everything may or may not be there. And I apologize. I, I, I spoke about two different events. This okay. one specific event and then some guy across the street from a bank. So let me clear that up. Okay. Um, generally speaking, you might introduce the suggested existence of video evidence in order to flush out a true story. Yes. And in this particular case, that's what you were doing. Yes, sir. And you had suggested to Mrs. Zimmerman that there was a really good chance that Trayvon Martin's phone, which you had in your possession, but it was dead, the phone was dead, and you couldn't really get it out yet, but that that was a really good chance that was going to have a video of this whole event. Yes, sir, I did. And that was, in effect, to get him to, if there was something to come clean to, that he would come clean to it. Yes, sir. Knowing, as you said, that if it's there and it shows something you didn't tell us about, it's going to be really bad for you. Yes, sir. And that was the way you said it, right? Yes, sir. And that was the reason why you said it, right? Yes, sir. And that was all part of your challenge interview? Yes, sir. And what did he say when you told him that? I believe his words were, thank God. I was hoping somebody would videotape it. What indication did him saying to you, thank God, I really hope somebody videotaped it, what did that indicate to you? In my opinion, would have been true. What the defendant was thinking or not? No, no, no. I, I'm sorry. I got something on that, and I apologize, Your Honor. Well, it, the question was, what did that indicate to him? To him Correct. To, um, Officer Serino. That was my question. Okay. Your so objection. What the defendant was thinking, I think the question was, maybe I misunderstood. No, it's the indication from that response, what did that indicate to Officer Serino? So overall. Let me rephrase the question. Uh, please. Mm -hmm. Sure. The fact that George Zimmerman said to you, thank God, I hope somebody did videotape the event or the whole event, what, his statement, what did that indicate to you? Either he was telling the truth or he was a complete um, pathological liar, one or two. Okay. Now let's look at overall. Is there anything else in this case where you got the insight that he might be a pathological liar? No. Matter of fact, everything he had told you to date had been corroborated by other evidence you were already aware of um, in the investigation that he was unaware of. Correct. Okay. So if we were to take pathological wire off the table as a possibility just for the purpose of this next question, mm -hmm. you think he was telling the truth? Yes. This is a good break. I think morning. it is, Your Honor. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> we're going to recess for the evening before.